It's a comfort to be able to see that road sign, 35 North, and you know you're heading in the right direction. You, you, you realize I did not turn south. I'm, I hate, I'm a man, okay? Someone said the reason Moses was stuck in the wilderness for 40 years is because he refused to ask directions. I'm a man. I, I, I like to be able to handle those things. I like to be able to do those things. And, and she thinks I never fail, but, and uh, I've fooled her for a long time now. But, but it's still just a natural reaction. It's a comfort to know you've looked at that sign and you're, you're assured you're on the right road. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? It's a way to put our doubts to rest, to put our fear to rest. And then all you've got to do to get to your direction, to your destination, is follow the signs. That's all you've got to do. But God's ways are not man's ways. God doesn't think like man thinks. He doesn't operate the way he operates. His wisdom is different than our wisdom. Fear says follow the signs. But faith says that signs follow your belief. I'm going to say that again so you can understand what I'm trying to preach today. Fear says follow the signs. You've got to have the proof to know. But faith says that signs are going to follow those that believe. Jesus was in Jerusalem. Now, this is early in his ministry. John uh, records this in chapter 2. Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was visiting the house of God. He was visiting the temple. And this was the first of two occasions that Jesus got so upset with what was going on inside of the temple that he took some some string, made himself literally a whip. The Bible calls it a scourge. He made himself a whip, and he went to driving out the, the money changers, the people that was making, selling merchandise to all of the people in the, in the house of God. It probably wouldn't have been so bad if they had provided a service but the fact was they were taken advantage of sincere people that had come to worship and, and using them to make money. That impulse, you got to do this, you got to have what I offer you. When you go to Walmart, there is a reason that you've got to go through a aisle of candy and Cheap goods, earbuds, batteries. What else is in that? Little flashlight things. You know what I'm talking about. And candy. And chips and beef jerky and candy. Because it's an impulse thing. You, oh, well, I'll get this right. I, you know, I forgot. I, 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 and you, you get things which you really don't need and stuff that is so cheap, it really is not going to last anyway. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm telling you. Because it's just that impulse. Well, Jesus is watching these people take advantage, charging huge amounts for something that they could have brought, could have done. I probably ought to do that. You know, assaging their guilt, taking care of those kind of things. And it made him mad. He got a whip. He drove them out of the temple. He turned their tables upside down. And he declared that his father's house was going to be a house of prayer. And they had made it a house of merchandise. Now, you want to see your pastor upset? You let somebody come in here, try to use this congregation so that they can make a living and your pastor is going to get very upset i appreciate the fact you like tupperware i'm glad tupperware is a yesterday thing what's some of those other things those at home decor stuff that used to come through huh 
home interior. You guys can come up with more of them than I could come up with because people would, you know, I'm trying to make some money on the side. Well, help your brother out. And, and they have parties which really are guilt things. Oh, don't even get me started on it. Don't even get me started on it. And all it is is when you come in and you see them, you begin to dread. Oh, no. Another sign-up sheet for another party for something that is 10 times more expensive than it ought to be. I can go to the dollar store and buy it cheaper. Anyway, Jesus got very upset, drove them out. And the Jews that are watching this, they, they inquired of Jesus. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 18, they asked him, uh, what sign showest thou us that thou doest these things? You, you're upset. You're, you're calling this your father's house. You're making yourself out to be somebody. What sign are you going to show us that you do these things? And Jesus answered unto them, and he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, he just took it from what they anticipated and expected. They thought he was going to produce some kind of, of act that would show everybody just how great he was because they had seen these false messiahs show up before. They had seen showmen come in and try to sway people, and they'd done all of those kind of things. And, and they're, so they're asking, we need some proof. We need a sign. We need something solid that we will know you are who you are. Jesus spoke almost in that riddle. I, I talked about it last Sunday, a parable. This is not a parable, but he spoke in concepts they could not comprehend because it was beyond their scope of understanding. Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. They're in the temple. They're looking at the obvious. They're saying, no way. It's not going to happen. It cannot happen. You cannot build this temple that took X amount of years to construct in three days. Jesus was not talking about stone, mortar, bricks, facades. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about his body. We know that. They had no way of knowing that. But he spoke that way so they would not understand he was literally preparing the path for his own demise when he said it but watch what John observed just a couple of verses later I read to you that but down just a couple of verses in verse 23 John's watching this and he says now when he was in Jerusalem talking about Jesus at the Passover in the feast day many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. That impressed them. They're asking for a sign, and now Jesus is doing miracles. And, and they, they started believing in Jesus. But watch what John says in verse 24. Check it out. Chapter 2, verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man what are you saying john john is saying he didn't give them what they wanted he didn't commit to them now interesting this is check it out somebody got your bible there look at this the word commit in verse 24 back up into verse 23 Many believed. Somebody say believed. believed. The word believed and the word commit are the identical Greek word. You don't see that in your English Bible, but it is exactly the same thing. They believed. They put their confidence in him, but he didn't have any confidence in them. Why? 
because Jesus knew how fickle man was. He didn't have to have somebody say, well, this one's a good one, that one's a bad one. He knew the propensity of mankind because somebody else is going to show up and they're going to do a miracle. It's like Janus and Jambres in the Old Testament. Whenever they threw down their, their rods and they became a snake, are you going to follow signs? Are you going to follow some kind of a miracle? Or are you going to walk by faith? Because if you're going to walk by signs, signs can fool you. It's altogether possible some some prankster is going to take down a highway sign and put up another sign just because they can just because they there's people that do all kinds of stuff on the internet we call them viruses why do they do it because they can they love to bring confusion you cannot trust those things. But let me tell you what you can trust. You can trust a God that said, I will. But God, I've got to have some proof. I've got to have some evidence. I've got to have something hard to, 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 to grab onto. No, you don't. If God said it, that's all you've got to have. That is all you have to have. You got just believe it because God said that's what's going to happen. They were following signs. Now, stay with me. This is going to be explained in Jesus' actions in just a couple of chapters later. Jesus now and the disciples have moved from Jerusalem and they have traveled up into the region of Galilee. Chapter 4. We're only two chapters later. You remember what happened in chapter 4. They had went to Samaria. They talked to the little lady at the well. And then they moved on past Samaria. And they went on up into the region called Galilee. Now, chapter 4, verse 46 says, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee. Now, that's familiar because this is the first place he did a miracle. He turned the water into wine. This is what happened at that particular place. There, there was something that he did that caught their attention. And he, the scripture said there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Somebody say Capernaum. That's not Cana. According to my research, that's a 25-mile journey. 23.6 by the by the if you flew it fly it like the crow flies but i've never seen a road yet that's like a crow flies it meanders around back and forth around this hill and all that kind of stuff it was at least 25 miles that's a pretty good distance on foot uh, you you get wore out all you kids that did the golden gate bridge i ask your your youth guy i ask him how long it took to get across it and he said about 45 minutes boy you really sacrificed what 45 minutes this way 45 minutes that way hour hour and a half you're you've done y'all didn't y'all didn't do 25 20 miles marches for missions like some of us did She's laughing at me. She, she thinks the old man's bragging on himself. How many of you did 20 mile marches for missions? Bunch of sissies? You probably did the 20 kilometer thing. Now they have 5K runs. So what? But, but 25 miles, that's a good distance. You're not going to get there in an afternoon going to take you a while and it's more than likely you'll spend the night somewhere before you get to where you're going now when this nobleman heard that Jesus was in Galilee he made that 25 mile trip to where Jesus was at and he asked him to come down and heal his son because his son was at the point of death this is where John tags into this then Jesus said unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. 
You're going to have to hang around and watch me do some things so that you can believe I'm able to do it. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, lest my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go your way, thy son liveth. Not a miracle done, not any proof, not a service that had, Woo! Mm, yeah! Nobody pumped him up. Nobody, no cheers, cheerleaders, no one given that kind of just a simple word from Jesus. Go your way, your son liveth. And the man believed the word of Jesus. John said, man, this dude, he heard what Jesus said. He believed him and he turned around and started heading back to Capernaum. Now, when he was going down, while he was heading home, his servants met him saying, thy son liveth. Hey, Doc, you, 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 I know you left with a heavy heart. We just come running to tell you, you don't have to worry because your boy lives. Woo! The man inquired, he asked the, the question of these servants, what hour was it that he began to mend? What time was it when he turned the, the, the corner? And they said, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew. He didn't know in advance. He didn't see miracles in advance. The father knew it was the same hour when Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, he believed, and his whole house. Y'all get what I'm trying to lay down? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Signs follow them that believe. It's not the other way around. It's not belief follows the sign. The signs follow them that believe. What are we, a bunch of Missourians? Anybody know what Missourians are supposed to be? You lived up there close to it. What's the, what's the motto of Missouri? The show me state. Prove it to me. I'll believe it when I see it. And sometimes we're just like that. It sounds to me, y'all pick it up what I'm dropping down. It sounds like one of the temptations that Jesus had to face when he was coming out of that wilderness after a 40-day fast. The devil comes to him. First thing he says, because Jesus was hungry, he said, turn these stones into bread. Could he have done it? Yes, but there's a law that says kind produces kind, and stones don't produce bread, and God could have, but he's not in doing kind of those kinds of acts uh, just so the devil can say, well, okay, I guess you were real. So the next one was, he, the devil said, if thou be God, if thou be God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot upon a stone. Prove yourself, Jesus. Show me, Jesus. You gotta, you gotta do something so that we don't have any doubt you are who you are. Why do you sit in the valley of decision? There's some of you that don't have your mind made up. You're not convinced, you're not convicted, you don't have that kind of faith. And I'm here to declare to you without that kind of faith, you're never going to make heaven your home. You won't make it. You'll, you'll end up in a devil's hell because you've got to have somebody prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt. Yes, sir. 
Jesus is saying, I don't have to do that. I don't have to prove myself so that you'll have faith. That's not how faith operates. That is built in doubt, not in faith. <laughs> you ready to preach my message? <laughs> Anybody heard of a disciple by the name of Thomas? Let's go to after the resurrection. Let's go, to, let's go to that period of time after Jesus has come alive. And he has showed himself to some disciples. Now, he didn't do that so that they would believe. It was just an appointment that he told them, go, go to Galilee. I'm going to meet you up there. And Thomas missed a church service. Yeah, it will, but I'm going to leave there. So Thomas wasn't with him. When, whenever that happened, the other disciples said it to him, we've seen Jesus. Thomas said what? Nah. He said, except I see in his hands the print of his nails and thrust my hand into, the, into his side, unless I have proof, I will not believe. Eight days later, Thomas is with him. Jesus shows up, and Jesus says, Peace unto you. Then he said to Thomas, <laughs> because he knew what was in Thomas's heart. Even though he wasn't there, he knew. Why? Because he's God Almighty. He said to Thomas, Reach thither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach your hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless. But believing, Thomas answered and said, My Lord, my God, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are they who have not seen. Blessed are they who have not seen, but believe. I am healed. Oh, really? What happened? You've been to the doctor? No, but it doesn't matter. I got a word from the Lord. And that's all that matters is I heard from God and God said, my son is coming home. How do you know? You got a phone call? No, but I got a word from the Lord and that's all I need. Somebody help me preach in this place. What's the problem with following signs? Mark chapter 13, verse 22, false Christ, false prophets shall rise. They shall show signs and miracles to seduce, if it were possible, the very elect. Come on, sis, because I'm not going to preach much longer. I want to see God do something in this house. I want to see somebody's faith Soar. I want to see somebody that said, God, you don't have to prove yourself to me. I just believe you because of who you are, and I believe your word. I believe, I believe that pastor was inspired of the Holy Ghost to remind me I don't have to have some kind of evidence. God doesn't have to prove himself to them that believe. I said, God doesn't have to prove himself to them that believe. They trust him regardless. It really doesn't matter what happens to me. I love the book of Habakkuk. The book, it's only three chapters long. You can read it in 15 minutes or less this afternoon. You can, you can get a grasp of what he's saying. But Habakkuk is upset at God for some things that have gone on. He, really, he lays out his complaint. God answers him. He lays it out the second time. And God answers him the second time. And it's in the midst of that answer that there is something that is said. That he literally tells Habakkuk, The just shall live by their faith. The just shall live by their faith. 
Then you get into chapter 3, and Habakkuk begins to respond as he celebrates and rejoices in the Lord. And in the last three verses, he's basically saying, if it doesn't have a harvest, I'm still going to trust you. If I don't see it, a single thing, if you don't, it, I'm still going to believe you. Why? Because the just are going to live by faith. They don't walk by sight. They walk by faith. Somebody shout it. They walk by faith. And God keeps showing up and showing out. He shows himself mighty to those who believe because signs follow them that believe. If you will obey what God says and take him at his word, I preached it, said it for so many times. I hope when I pass away and you guys get up and remember famous things that Pastor said, I hope you'll remember this one thing. Obedience always precedes the miracle. Obedience always precedes the miracle. Not the miracle produces my obedience. My obedience is done long before I ever see the result because I'm going to take him at his word. Before the rain comes, I'll dig the ditch. Before the miracle occurs, I'll set a room for my miracle. Somebody shout amen. I heard, I heard brother Brother Anthony Zuniga talking to us this morning, talking about, you know, you've got some things going on in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done. You just come on down to the altar. Well, why the altar? Because the altar is a place where self dies. I know this spot is not specially sanctified. It's just the fact it's an act of faith. When you get out of your pew and you walk down an aisle and you stand before God, it's showing everybody, I'm stepping out on faith. I'm believing God is going to do what he said he would do. Woo! There's some that just, they hear the Spirit. They, they hear what the Lord is saying. But I'm telling somebody that's been sitting back, your miracle is in this place. If you'll just trust God and believe Him, signs are going to follow. You need your marriage to get fixed. You need a problem to get right. You need God to provide an answer. Why don't you just step out in faith? And trust God is going to supply what he said he would supply.